Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is episode 46, Barcelona's Groundbreaking Transsexual Monuments. When you think of monuments to civil rights, it's easy for straight people to overlook monuments to LGBTQ people in travel, but I think it's because there is a severe lack of monuments to LGBTQ people, things that commemorate important events and the history of LGBTQ rights. When I met our guest um, last year, he told me a story that changed my perspective on travel because it made me realize there was an entire part of human history that I simply was overlooking as I went around the world. He told me about this wonderful place in Barcelona. When I was in Barcelona in February, I, I went and saw it for myself. And um, I'm so excited to have Jose on to tell you all all about it too. Jose Ramon Harvey, is uh, he's a friend of mine and he is the author of the travel blog, My Normal Gay Life. And I'm so excited that he is going to share uh, with you all the history of this interesting place that seems to be unfortunately singular If you all, in listening to this story, can think of any places that are similar in the world, I would love if you would email me and tell me about them because I would love to go see them. So after the interview, I'm going to, I know that I actually haven't done an intro in about uh, 11 episodes and I apologize sincerely. After the show, I will do a big housekeeping and and, and after the interview, tell you all about what was going on, um, where I am in the world, and um, some other fun, cool things. I have a new podcast I'll tell you guys about, so uh, stay tuned for the end of the show for that, but um, now on to the interview. My guest today is Jose Ramon Harvey. He is the travel writer behind the website My Normal Gay Life. Hi, Jose. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Awesome. So the place that we're going to talk about today is actually, um, this is the first time I've been in a situation where a friend of mine told me about a place and I, the the place that we're going to talk about today is a place that you actually told me about because you and I are friends and we um, were traveling together last year. You told me about this, this incredible place, which we're going to get to. And you told me the story and I cried, like I cried on a bus (laughs) in public because the story was so moving. So then when I went to Barcelona, I actually went and sought out this place. So first of all, I want to thank you for telling me about it. And I'm excited to talk to you about it again. But also, this is part of why I love uh, or want to do the show, because there are some places like like this one that aren't in every guidebook. And it really is word of mouth that gets it out. So thank you for so much for coming on and telling all the listeners the, what you've already told me. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. I I always like, you know, spreading our LGBT history because it's not always extremely well known. Yeah, so um, obviously, like from the website name, uh, My Normal Gay Life, it people probably got the idea that you write about gay issues. You write a lot specifically about travel and what it's like and safety issues around traveling as a gay man and then issues in the community. But what else do you focus on? Yeah, so I, um, I, yeah, I write about, uh, gay travel and LGBT issues sometimes. The website, though, I, I, I do focus on travel heavily. And I always tell people that I write about travel in general. Like, gay travel is no different than straight travel, I guess. Um, we, we all travel the same, really. Um, so I write about travel in general. But then also I, fo- I, I focus on some food food uh, themes. And, uh, and then recently I've started expanding my website to include more topics about family life when it comes to my personal family and um and lifestyle and stuff like that so i'm trying to kind of expand it out just a bit excellent so now you say like uh straight travel is the same as gay travel i I think that probably that's like 95 percent true and then traveling with you and when we've been planning trips i've realized there are some issues that you have to deal with that i haven't um as a solo female traveler i feel like people always assume i have safety issues i have to deal with and i think that you have similar yet but slightly different safety issues um and we have to think about different parts of the world like some parts of the world are more safe for me and some parts of the world are more safe for you but it's always interesting to me that you you have to cover that aspect for your readers when I have to cover it, I just have to cover it from a different perspective. 
yeah, um, safety definitely is a concern. And I guess I'm so used to like having to deal with it that I don't really, I, I don't really think about it that much. Um, although I do often include that information in what I write. But yeah, when when, when we travel as as gay as a gay man and as as a bigger part of the LGBT community, um, we we do have to think about the way that we're perceived. Unfortunately, because in some places, if you're perceived as gay, then you could be in a lot of danger. You could you could be harassed or you could be um, physically assaulted. Um, oftentimes, if we're traveling, my husband and I, um, we have to think about you know, uh, um, is it okay that we get a room with one bed in it, or is that going to seem odd to the people at the hotel and is that going to cause a problem? So yeah, I mean, safety is always um, a big issue when it comes to gay travel. So that's. That's definitely one way that's different than, I guess, straight travel. Yeah, I think it's like, um, so like as a woman, and I know this is a tangent and we'll get back, but like, so it's like a straight woman, when I travel by myself, I usually have to think about safety in the outside world. And so when it, whenever I've heard you advocate, or like um, we were in a situation where you had to like, literally address um, a tourism board to see like what their opinion was on it, and it didn't go well. But it's so interesting to me how much you have you guys have to think about safety on the inside, like of a hotel room or in, in, in safe spaces, because people are judging you differently. Whereas women tend to be more worried about like, am I going to be harassed in public? Am I going to be allowed to exist in public in this place? And so and so it's just interesting to hear like all of your most of your questions are, am I going to be allowed to exist in private in this place? Um, and then obviously, like anything that's in public with uh PDA, there's certain parts of the world that not so great for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah, what, what we do in private um, as, as gay people is often, <laughs> is often um, a big issue for so many people that are not involved in that situation, you know? So um, I guess it's just part of being a gay guy, and um, we, I, I often don't give it too much thought. It's just sort of part of who I am to, 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 to make these adjustments for that, for those purposes. So what we're going to talk about today is um, the Glorieta Bandstand in Barcelona. And one difference in the way that sometimes you travel, not always the way that you travel, but sometimes when I hear about you planning trips versus the way that I plan trips, is a lot of times you're, you're looking for important places in gay history. And when I hear you talk about that, I realize that I don't do that enough. <laughs> like, it's just, that should be on my agenda too. And it hasn't been enough. And so um, that's one way that you've really influenced me and in how I travel. And so, but this place is specifically a place that you um, went to in Barcelona. Why don't you tell people a little bit about the, what Barcelona was like in the early 90s for gay LGBT, LGBTQ citizens, and then kind of how, how this bandstand ended up tragically um, becoming important. Okay, yeah. So basically, um, in the early 90s, Barcelona was actually pretty far ahead of the game when it came to gay rights, at the very least. Um, they, they'd already passed, um, they, they'd already decriminalized homosexual acts in Spain in, the, in 1979. So it wasn't illegal to be a homosexual or to engage in homosexual acts, as they put it. But, um, I mean, that, 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 like I said, that was pretty um, advanced as far as the rest of the world was going. But in the early 90s, when this happened, um, there was basically no protections whatsoever for trans people in this um, country, in Spain. So um, this, this, this murder that happened, it, it was a really big deal because it served as sort of a galvanizing drive behind not only the gay rights movement in Spain, but on top of that, creating more rights and protections for trans people within the country. So let's talk about the murder that happened that kind of sparked this situation. So Sonia was a transsexual woman who lived in Barcelona in the early 90s. And what happened to her? So, okay, so Sonia, her full name is Sonia Rescalvo Zafra, um, and that was her chosen name. Um, she was, she basically ran away from home when she was 16 years old because obviously she was having, um, identity issues and her family probably, as we can assume her family probably wasn't as supportive of that as 
she needed them to be. So for a while there, she worked at this theater um, in, uh, in, in, in Barcelona called the Arnal Theater. Um, but eventually, she had to resort to prostitution, like so many trans people did at the time, and so many still do, actually. Because... Can we stop for a second and talk about that? Because I think that the misconception is that the that transsexuality and prostitution are related out of some kind of like that it's on the transsexual persons that it's something about them as opposed to something about society so how yes. why is it that so many I, I just think that it's important to to explain to people why that's something that you tend to see yeah so basically um so, like I said, during the time there was there was really no protections for trans people, and since there were no protections for trans people, a trans person who was living their lives genuinely as the person that they are might not be able to find work. Like if I had a business and at the time, and I had a negative attitude towards you know trans people, and I just think, oh, that's just a man dressing up as a woman, um, then I might not hire that person. And if I did hire that person, there's nothing that could stop me from firing that person. So oftentimes there literally was no work for people like Sonia. And when there's no work, sometimes the easiest thing you can turn to is sex work because you have no, no other options. You're powerless. And because you're all, you always own the means of that. Whereas right. to know, even though it's, it can be dangerous, it's a situation that some people choose and some people are forced into. But if you have a society where you have a whole group of people who are just trying to live their lives and you make that impossible for them, that that's going to be a natural place for them to go because it's one of the only things that you can't take away from them. Exactly. Exactly. So when we say that she was working, I just want to make sure that when people understand that, that um, she was that part of the incident was that she was a, she was a transsexual working as a prostitute, that that is not necessarily a, a, an accumulation of life choices that is an accumulation of circumstances, which is part of why the story breaks my heart even more. I was just going to say that, yes, it was her circumstances that caused it. I believe that if the circumstances had been different, let's say that there were protections in place for people such as Sonia, um, then I don't believe that she would have chosen sex work. Um, often, most people are not going to choose to go into sex work just because they want to do sex work. It's usually they have no other choice. So circumstances are usually the things that always force these, um, as force people into that type of situation. And it's, and it's, I, you know, I don't believe that there's any shame in it. I'm very liberal. I think people should have the ability to choose it, but I just think that people need, uh, when we're talking about this particular story, we're not talking about a, a world in which somebody had a lot of free choices. And so exactly. whatever judgments people would have put, like, that's just something that they need to be aware of. And unfortunately, I think it's it's hard even for people who mean really well to keep all of your judgments out when society has programmed us to feel a certain way. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, as a result of her her uh, life circumstances at the time, she was homeless. Um, so she was sleeping in the park at that night. She was sleeping um, on the bandstand. It may have been near the bandstand. I'm not really quite so sure about that tiny little detail, but she was there. And she was sleeping. And um, let's describe she, the bandstand. So she was. So she was in the park at night. And so the bandstand. It literally almost looks like a wooden carousel, except it's for. It's like a giant gazebo. But it really. What you know? What was it used for? And what's this park like that it's in? Yeah. So this bandstand was always used for just musical performances, really. Um, and the park is huge. It's one of Barcelona's more famous parks. It's called Park Park uh, Park de la Citadela, and. Um, so it's just a very huge park. And then today it's a great place and people have picnics and everything there. But I think back in the day, it might not have been the most, you know, luxurious place to go for an evening or anything. Um, so, yeah, it's just a normal, basically wooden and metal structure for having concerts under. It's, it's really nothing special, which is kind of remarkable as well, especially given the story behind what it's dedicated to today. Okay, so she's in this park, it's at night, she's in a community where she's not protected, um, mm -hmm. and this is kind of around the time of the Olympics, so there was a lot of, like, modernization going on in Barcelona, you know, it was a very modern, beautiful city, it still is, it's um, even more so now than it was at the time, um, so what happened to Sonia that night? So, um, just let me um, back up just one, one yeah. little bit, um, what's real? I'm glad that you brought up the Olympics, because this murder, along with 
during the Olympics, there was a huge push in Barcelona when the when the Olympics were about to happen to get rid of all those of the sex workers. To to they were being shamed and pushed away and everything else. And so. Uh, a movement sort of sprung up to fight for sex workers' rights as well as for the rights of uh, um, trans people as a result of this murder and the actions of the Catalonian government during the Olympics. So I think that's uh, important. Yeah, I, so I, as somebody who loves the Olympics, I do think one of the things that is hard for me is that every time a city hosts the Olympics, there are negative consequences for large groups of oh, yeah. people and those people are always the least the most disenfranchised and the people that are having the hardest time there anyway like when we were I was in Rio the I was in Rio a year before the Olympics that were there and so they were already tearing down some of the favelas to make room for things and yeah. when you tear down a favela you're making a lot of people homeless um, exactly. so as somebody who loves the Olympics I don't know how I just, it, that is something that is always hard to grapple with for me. Yeah. So, so more is going on in Barcelona than just, than normal. So at this time, there's a lot of political movements in Barcelona. There's a lot of money flowing in for the Olympics. There's a lot of pressure on different people. And that is kind of culminating in different groups of feeling, different groups of people feeling different ways and boiling to the surface. And so let's go back to Sonia that night. So how did this end up affecting her? Okay, so that night she was sleeping in this bandstand and minding her own business, really. Um, and she was with a friend named Dory as well. And um, she, they weren't the only people in the apart. It was a common place for people to sleep who were homeless. And also the bandstand was a place where homosexual men and women, as well as transgendered people, would congregate in the evenings. And a lot of them would end up you know, sleeping there. So that night, it was October the 6th, 1991. Sonia was um, 45 years old at the time. And um, six, uh, six or seven neo-Nazis um, came into the park and they targeted the bandstand. Uh, they, they recognized Sonia as um, a transgendered person. Um, to them, she was just a man who liked to dress up as a woman. Um, so they had no respect for her and they attacked her and kicked her she had they the 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 uh, the, the neo Nazis had um, steel toed boots on, and they kicked her and they kicked her and they beat her until she died. And to tell you that, like to to, to to illustrate how how aggressive they attacked this woman, one of the one of the um, the attackers actually broke his toe and ripped his toenail off of his foot, even though he had um, steel toed boots on. So this was really a vicious attack. And not only did they hurt her and kill her, they hurt her friend um, who was sleeping with her. Her name was Dory. And um, they also, um, Dory, Dory survived, by the way. Um, and they also attacked another person as well, a gay man. And they beat him in the face with something and caused him to go permanently blind. Oh my gosh, so, I, don't, I didn't realize that part of the story. Yeah, this, is, this was not just like, I mean, any any crime like this is horrible, but this wasn't just this was vicious and this was just pure hatred. So she died. So basically that happens. Right. So after after this happened, there was um, the press um, showed very little respect for Sonia um, in their coverage. They used her birth name, not the name that she had chosen for herself. They re referred to her using masculine pronouns instead of using female pronouns with, with which she identified. And um Instead of calling her a transgendered or transsexual person, they referred to her as a gay transvestite. Um, so they had little sympathy and little respect for her at all, even in her in, in this horrible, horrible, vicious attack. So after the, this happens, what happens to the neo-Nazis? It sounds like we know a lot okay. about them. Yeah, so basically um, an investigation was launched into this crime because there was a lot of even despite the, the media coverage of it, um, there was a lot of outrage um, from like the gay community. Um, you know, oftentimes in history, the gay community will take a lot, but then it just takes one little thing and suddenly we're just this powder keg of let's, let's stir things up. But um, so, so basically they launched this investigation and eventually um, 
a man, they, 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 they had this man under surveillance. I guess he was a suspect at the time. His name was Hector Lopez um, Fruta, Frutos or Frutas. And um, he was kind of harassing a woman. So he was being surveil- surveilled by the police. And they recorded him saying this. And I, I'm going to be translating this from Spanish. So um, it, it might not be 100% um, accurate. But he basically, I think it was a prostitute that he was talking to. And he said, do you want to come to my house tonight? And she said, no, no. And he goes, you always tell me no. Um, are you afraid to come to my house? And she said, of your house? No, I'm afraid of you. And then she, he said, well, it's not like I, I'm a transvestite. Or, uh, or no, he said, he said, it's not like you're a transvestite. And she goes, no, but you're getting crazy. And he said, he's like, you know who, who, did, that, who did that horrible thing to that transvestite in, in, the park, in the park? And she says, no. And he goes, well, I do. And as a result of that conversation that the police were able to um, capture, that, that, that was enough to, you know, um, to detain him, um, question him. And it led to the arrest of the actual um, murderers, himself included. And so there was a trial, et cetera. Three years later, they were sentenced to 310 years in prison each. Oh, my gosh. Um, which is a, a huge victory on, for, like, the gay community. It doesn't bring back Sonia, but it's a huge victory. But here's the here's Here's the catch to this all. So they were they were sentenced to 310 years each. Um, however, their sentences were reduced by half by the Spain Supreme Court. And then, as of 2011, all of them are free except for two of the murderers. Whoa! So it, you know, it, it was you can say that justice was served, but really, was it? You know? Yeah. So they so all of them served almost 20 years, but not what they were not sentenced the, to. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so how does Barcelona go from this place that wants to be liberal but is having a lot of backlash and 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 um, you know you know I don't think any place in the world could really be considered progressive in 1991 on LGBTQ issues, especially when it mm-hmm. comes to you know the further out you get from maybe what people think of as you know, just the further out you get on the spectrum, the harder it is for societies to get everyone all of the rights that they deserve. Yeah. Whether or not they work on it or not being a different issue. So how did, how did they go from there to the more liberal, more accepting place that Spain is today? And and where does Spain really fit on the gay rights spectrum? So Spain itself, um, it just varies across the country, sort of like it does here in the United States. Generally speaking, there's laws protecting people, but of course, if you go to certain parts of the country, it might not be all. It might might not always be the case that um, that those are really adhered to. So, during during okay, so Spain itself during Franco's rule, um, homosexuality was criminalized. When when Franco uh, Franco when he died um, in seventy five, four years later, homosexuality was decriminalized. So that was a big deal. In 1991, of course, like I said, there was nothing really in place to protect trans people, but at the very least, gay relationships were not criminalized. However, just a few years later, in 1994, Spain passed a law that um, allowed cohabitation between sex, same-sex couples, um, unregistered cohabitation between sex couples, same-sex couples. So basically a law that allowed same-sex people to exist like everyone else, you know? Um, <laughs> And then um, in 1997, they created um, a law that allowed registered partnerships between same-sex couples that was recognized by the cities, of the, the governments of certain cities. So, and now, of course, now today, I mean, it's sort of been like a water slide. And, and in a lot of places, it's been such a quick, um, it's been so quick, you know, um, even in the United States, where we've gained equal rights under the law. So now today, there's equal rights everywhere in Spain. There's, um, they can openly serve in the military. There's, um, they, get, they can have benefits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and, and, I, and, and the thing about Barcelona itself is it's always been a city of acceptance. Um, and, and that's what they're very proud of. They've always, you know, they've been a city for artists and for the, the deviants of the world, I guess you could say. Um, they, they've always had their arms open to that. Um, and, and today, of course, um, LGBT culture is, is a huge deal in Barcelona. There's a lot of different sections of the city dedicated 
to the LGBT community, and um, you can definitely see the influence there. So now let's go back and talk about this monument. How did it? How did it go from a place that a tragedy happened to a place that you and I would would learn about on a visit? Like, I I I can think of very few places in the United States or even around the world that I've been to that are truly dedicated to the preservation of LGBTQ history. And yeah. especially outside of like a museum, and, you know, all I can really think of is uh, Stonewall in New York and I haven't been there. <laughs> like, um, so I, it, I think it's just one of those things that one, I'm so glad it exists, but I'm also so glad that I went because it made me interested to see places like that around the world because every country has places. Mm hmm. Maybe they're not official. Maybe they haven't got, you know, maybe they're not as progressive as Barcelona to mark them, but every country has places I should be learning about that are similar. Yeah. So one of the things that I love about this monument is that, yes, it's part of LGBT history, but I think the biggest thing it's, is the T. It's something specifically dedicated to, trans, to a trans person, therefore the trans community. And that's something that there's not a lot of around the world. And I think that's a huge deal that this city allowed something to be memorialized in memory of a trans woman. I, so, I completely like agree. Like, and it's one of those things where, um, you know, I can think of very few places in the world dedicated to gay and lesbian rights, like memorializing them, especially real world places and not in educational institutions. And I, and I, I, you know, I, if any listener can think of any other place in the world that is dedicated to trans rights like this, I would love to go see it. I, I do think that it's, it is um, shocking how little this group of people who have had to fight so hard ha has been recognized for their contributions to society, for, um, you know, for the victories that they have won, you know, against oppression like it's just there should be more places in the world like this and and it's this one happens to to memorialize a tragedy which mm -hmm. I, but i mean there should be places that also memorialize successes and i can't think of any me and i can't either and you know and i think it's really important to highlight the fact that like trans people have always been have always played a huge role you know in in the in in in, in gaining equal rights for LGBT people in general. Um, I mean, the Stonewall riots were started in, uh, in New York, and a, tr a trans African American uh, woman uh, basically led that. So, and then uh, uh, Marsha P. Johnson, and we often forget that. Or, and, you know, so yeah, for me, the trans thing is a very big deal. Um, <laughs> so, getting back to the bandstand though, um, so basically, after the murder, in 1993, there was a group, um, I'm going to say it in Spanish, and then I'll try to translate it in English. The group is called the Coordinadora de Frentes de Liberación Homosexual del Estado Español. So basically, it's, I'm not going to translate that, but it's basically, because um, I don't know how to translate that, but it's basically, um, this, it's an organization for, for a gay liberation front um, of the state of Spain. Um, so they go into this park, and they place a commemorative plaque near the bandstand. And it's allowed to stay, right? So then, that that basically is all that it is for basic for more than a decade. That's that's all it is. It's just this commemorative plaque. It's not official. There's there's nothing official about it, but the city allows it to stay, and nobody questions it. Well, in 2011, um, in the same park, there's another monument. It's a triangle made of marble, and it's called the monument. It's a monument in memory of gays, lesbians, and trans people persecuted throughout history. Um, so this, this monument was placed in the park in 2011, specifically because of Sonia's murder. So they wanted this monument to be in the same park because Sonia was murdered in this park. Um, so that was placed there. And as a result of that, in 2013, the bandstand was renamed by the city, um, and it was called, it's called Glorieta de la Transsexual Sonia, or the bandstand of the transsexual Sonia. Um, with a new plaque that's a lot more visible, um, if, if you're looking really. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not. But, it doesn't like scream, but it is like a like a three foot tall um, plaque, like a thing that and it, it doesn't just like say like here. It's not like a silver plaque. It's like it literally tells you what happened in three languages or maybe two languages. Yeah. 
and they're, and they're not very, um, they're not very, like, so the, so the plaque actually says to Sonia Rescalvo Zafra, who died brutally, no, um, excuse me, who was brutally murdered um, the 6th of October, 1991 in the, on, in this bandstand by a group of neo-Nazis for her gender identity. Uh, the city of Barcelona condemns this crime and rebukes any attitude or actions that would place in jeopardy the, the rights given through the Declaration, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, so that's what the plaque says. So it's, it's much more, much, much more official. And also it's sanctioned by the city, which is a huge deal. Yeah, I, I feel it, <laughs> this is a mark of how um, underserved the transsexual community still is, that it feels like like rebellious and transgressive that Barcelona even has a plaque to her. Yes, yes. And that is not, um, I mean, you know, that is a condemnation on the rest of us. <laughs> like, yes, cause it, it shouldn't feel that way. You know, like it should be like, it should be something that we see because this is a population of people that have existed amongst us for the entire history of humanity. Exactly. So let's yeah. talk about um, a little bit. So when you went to Barcelona, you didn't, this wasn't the only site that you saw that specifically related to LGBTQ history. What were some other ones that you saw? So basically while I was in um, Barcelona, at least for this trip, I've gone there so many times. I love that city. <laughs> but um, uh, So while I was there, I actually worked with this company called Rainbow Barcelona um, Tours. And they basically focus on um, gay historic tours of Barcelona and the, uh, and the surrounding region. Um, and now they actually have expanded, so they're working with like they're working within a lot of cities. I think they're just called Rainbow Gay Tours. Um, so, so I went on this tour with them, and they took me through the city. It was a very fast tour, so I went back and you know walked around on my own and try to find everything that I could remember. Oh, um, press trips are always too fast. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so basically, um, the well, not always, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so we started at the Arc of Triumph in the center of the city um, because that's where the World's Fair was held. And um, apparently gay people had played a big role in um, putting that World's Fair together. So that was kind of a big deal for them. Um, and then we went to the park, Park de la Citadela, where we saw the bandstand, where we saw the work of Gaudi that's in the park. You know, the big, there's a huge fountain there. And, um, and then there's um, the monument to gays, lesbians, and trans people persecuted throughout history. Uh, from there, there's a place, um, well, this theater, um, Arnold Theater, it's no longer open, but the building is still there. The building's been around since the 1800s, and it was actually a really important place for gay people. Um, they would often go to this theater to congregate, to see one another, and stuff like that. So, and, and that's not such a remarkable place to go, actually. It's basically just an abandoned building, but um, it is part of the history. There's a section of the city called El Raval, and... Um, it's basically this area that back in the day, sort of, uh, it was sort of a place where all the, what society considered bad people would hang out. So homosexuals and trans people, um, thieves and, and the like, all hung out in this area. And over time, this area has kind of evolved. So El Raval, at, now it's more like a Chinatown area, um, but not in a kishy, trashy kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> um, during that time, though, back in the day, a lot of places, um, there were a lot of businesses open that were basically called singing houses. And you could go there and you could see, you know, drag performance and stuff during a time when that wasn't always very common. Today, um, it's more of a touristic area, although there are a few bars there, which whose name whose names um, totally I can't remember. But if you go there, you'll find them. They're not hard to miss. Um, and uh, there's a lot of art and stuff in the area. There's even a a giant uh, statue of a cat by Botero, the Colombian artist there. Oh, so, actually, I think I saw one by him uh, in Yerevan today. Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of funny where his his art is um, everywhere. It's ended up everywhere. Yeah. So, and I love that cat statue. His cat's just like, of course, Botero's works all fat, fat things. So, the cat is beautiful. But um, <laughs> yeah, so and then of course you have. Um, there's an area called Gracia, and that, that area is not necessarily a gay community. However, 
it is an area where a lot of gay people live. And so it's a good mixture of gay and non-gay culture together there. And it's a, there's a lot of art as well. And then the main gay neighborhood of Barcelona today is called Eixampla. Um Eixampla is, it, it, it's not spelled the way that you think it would be spelled, but um, it's, that's like literally where most gay people, most gay people live in Barcelona. There's um, a ton of gay bars and clubs and gay owned restaurants and everything else. You'll even find what I call gay clothing store because they sell clothes that fit men. Um, so <laughs> it's a real area, a real cool area. It's always where I stay when I go to Barcelona because for me, I want to be at night. I want to be close to where I'm going to have to stumble back home, you know? Yeah. Uh, and um, it's also colloquially, colloquially, um, known as gay shabla by the local community so <laughs> um, yeah so it's pretty cool so when you travel you also focus a lot and write about the foods of places what was some food recommendations that you would have for someone visiting barcelona well um so one recommendation i would have is skip the restaurants <laughs> just just once and go to a market. There's some famous markets in the city. They're not hard to find. And you can totally fill yourself up and by walking around this market and, and, and eating and tasting things in the market. And that's like real local foods, you know, like sausages from farms outside of Barcelona and fruit that was grown in Spain. It's, it's awesome. I agree. When I was when I was in Barcelona, I worked with a company called um, Bite Mojo, which is like a food app where you can. It's great for introverts because you like download the app into your phone and you go on a food tour, but you don't have to be in a group of twenty people. Like so, me and my friend did it, just the two of us, and we went to La yeah. Boqueria, and which is one of the markets. And oh my god, it was so good. Yeah, uh, La Boqueria is the most famous one, and um, yeah, Bite Mojo is awesome. Like yeah, I, I really worked like with them. them. Um, Israel, I, I met um, Michael Weiss. He's the, the the guy who runs the company. And, yeah, I love that app. It's totally, totally worth it. Uh, yeah, I, but, would, uh, I would if I didn't know them and I, I, like, and I hadn't worked with them. I, I, I do think it's worth the money to pay for them because, one, Barcelona yeah. is an expensive city anyway. So the food tour is going to cost the same price as a meal, but you also get, like, a little bit better food and you get some history and, like, it's it's – you, and you also get to try out different places so you know where to go back to. Like, it's a super, they're a super cool company. Oh, yeah. Like, it's so cool. And and, and the cool thing about this food tour is, like, it's totally self-guided. Yeah. So you go at your own pace as long as you do it, you know, in the day that you have to do it. But um, it just, like, and it helps you see more of the city. I don't know. I just think it's fun. That's I, I do. Really I just, it is. It's one of those things where it's just fun. And um, I don't think a lot of people know that you can go on a food tour without having to meet anyone. Sometimes when I, exactly. I, I love, I, I do love people. But sometimes when I travel, I just get overwhelmed and I don't want to meet a lot of people. Or like yeah. I was recently on a tour where the other people on the tour were extremely unpleasant. And so mm -hmm. sometimes you just want to be by yourself, but still learn everything, which is why I love Rick Steves audio walking tours that you can download on iTunes. I love any tour like Bite Mojo where you can just download it into your phone and not talk to anyone. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and that's a great way to, um, to try a lot of different things, I think. Um, if it's by Mojo or any food tour, that's a good way to really get a taste of the city. But then, but then like, like, some of the things that I like, of course, if you're in Barcelona, hello, tapas. Like, and there's a million tapas places. Oh, the tapas Not all so of them fun. are equal. But, you know, um, I, I love tapas. It's fun to be, you know, with a person or more people and everybody orders something and you share. That's a really big part of the culture there in Barcelona. It's um, uh, dinner should be a time for sharing your food, which is a bit different in than in most Western cultures. Yeah, I don't like know? sharing my food. I like not that like I just I I like feeling like I ordered what I want and I don't. Yeah. You know, so like even when I do tapas, sometimes it's like I just want these. These are my things. Like maybe we'll get something to share, but like I still want to know that I have like one thing because I just I think it's because I had so many siblings that it's just like. I just, I want control. I want to take home leftovers, like, and I want to pick out the thing that I like. Yeah. But in, uh, so it's always funny when I hit a food culture that's not like that. It just, uh, it's, it's well, part of why travel is good. It makes you do different things and like oh, experience yeah. the world differently. Yeah. I mean, if you don't, don't like to share your food, then well, whoops, but, <laughs> but, um, 
but that's part of the culture there. You don't have to do that, obviously, but that is part of the culture there. Um, one of my favorite tapas, and, and, and I think when we were in Greece recently, you saw me eating them, is the little fried fish. Oh, um, yeah. I have a picture of you. Like, oh, recently I did an episode with Maggie. So of the people that we were in Greece with, Megan Stetzel did an episode about Bordeaux. Maggie did an ep- Maggie um, Garvin did an episode about Disney World. Allison Green, who's also my business partner, did an episode about Albania. I'm trying to think. I think I think that's it. But like that, I was like, these are. It was a house full of extremely well traveled people, um, <laughs> all drinking really terrible wine. <laughs> Yeah, so um, that, that's my favorite uh, tapas is the little the little fishes because like I feel like a giant when I'm eating them. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, and then the other thing that's kind of cool about Barcelona is um, there's a lot of like uh, ver- vermouth is a big deal in Barcelona, and um, there's these there are these establishments called ver- uh, vermuterias where you can drink vermouth. Um, personally, I hate vermouth. I think it tastes like crap, but um, a lot of people there do like it. And if you go to one of these places, they also serve wine and sangria and whatever. But usually if you order a drink, you get a tapas with it, like a little plate of something. They'll bring you out something. So that's a good way to like um, drink and also eat at the same time. <laughs> yeah. For, for free oh, stuff. man. Uh, so Chris Mitchell and I host another show, which I haven't even told my audience about yet. I think I told them it was coming, but I haven't actually told them about it. So I'll tell them about it at the end of this episode. But we have an episode all about Barcelona. And we yeah. talk a lot about tapas. And if, if you're listening to this episode to plan a trip to Barcelona, you should also listen to that episode because that's got tons of travel tips in it. Um, so, Jose, is there any advice that you would have about where a person should go if they realize that they've made it to 33 years old and they have not been incorporating LGBTQ history in their history travel and they want to start doing that are there like resources like how do you discover the places that you want that you should go um well you know um as for places that you should go there's i mean i always seek them out and we're getting more and more places um but i think that with time that's going to become more and more common but right now it's a lot harder to find so even i have a hard time sometimes finding um places it's like you know for so much of our history we've had, um, I guess you could say a heterosexual society that was trying to stamp us out. Yeah. We didn't exist. So our, our, much of our history has been one of secretiveness, like, you know, hiding, um, being who we are, but being who we are quietly. So it's not as common as I wish it would be. But so for instance, there's a monument in Berlin that's dedicated to the homosexuals murdered by, um, under uh, Nazi socialism. And it's inc- it's an incredibly powerful monument. Um, it's right next to the Holocaust Memorial, the more famous Holocaust Memorial, and um, it's basically just like a giant metal block. And inside, when you look through the window in, in the back of the block, there's a giant screen, and it just shows many, 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 many shots of gay couples kissing. Aww. And it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And the artist actually, it's, you can miss it. I actually didn't even know it existed. I didn't do any research before I went to Berlin. So I didn't even know it existed. I was walking by and I saw a little sign and I was like, huh. So I walked over and I found it. And the thing about that, um, the artist wanted it hidden um, and hard to find because he said that basically it was, the idea was that it needed to be hidden because for so long homosexuals have had to be hidden. And in so many parts of the world, homosexual people or L- LGBT people in general cannot come out of the closet. They are not allowed to be who they are. So that was part of his message with that. But yeah, it's right next to the Holocaust Memorial. Well, I'm actually, uh, I'm going to be house sitting, hopefully. I'm supposed to be house sitting one of my best friends from college's cat for two weeks in okay. Berlin in November. So I will definitely go. Okay. And when I do, I'll share a bunch of pictures on the Facebook page. Yes. So there's that. And then um, there's um, obviously Stonewall in, uh, in, in New York, where the modern gay uh, rights movement um, has had its start, so to speak. Although I will say Berlin, in my opinion, is the place you should go if you want to explore um, like the beginning of gay rights. Because before World War II, like they were way ahead of the curve. They were about to legalize gay marriage in Berlin before the Nazis took over. So, um, yeah, the, Berlin was the home of the first, like, gay publication and the first gay rights um, organization, all kinds of stuff like that. 
But um, yeah, so New York, Stonewall Village, of course, now, unfortunately, if you go to Florida, to Orlando, um, the Pulse nightclub, um, it's closed. There's a fence around it, but it literally is surrounded by flowers and stuff all the time. It's It can never be a club again. Um, is there so, a movement to preserve any part yeah. of it or, okay. Well, I think there is, I'm not sure. So uh, there's a lot of, you know, murmurs about what's going to happen with it. So on one hand, I think the owners were like, maybe we should reopen this as a club. You know, like this is a symbol that you can't hold us down. Ah, uh, that doesn't sit well with me because I don't want to go to a club where 50 people were murdered, you know, but, um, and but I think the bigger piece that's going to happen is they want to turn it into a permanent memorial to those people because, I mean, that's a huge attack, um, um, a huge modern attack on the LGBT community. And specifically that night, LGBT Latin Americans. Um, so because it, um, it was Latino night that night at the club. So the majority of the people murdered that night were, um, were, were of Latin American descent, which is often something that's not covered. That was not covered in the media. Oh, really? Um, so... Yeah, yeah, I guess I feel like, like I, I guess I just feel like I know enough about uh, Orlando and Florida culture and watching the interviews of people. I guess I just took away the fact, the idea that it was a heavily Latino uh, community that was there that night. But I don't know if I don't know if that's just because I was looking for it and it not it wasn't explicit. Yeah, I just think that it's important because I just think it's especially in the United States. You know, it's it's important to to make those uh, well dis- with intersectionality whenever you're talking about people that have multiple levels of different layers of privileges coming from different mm-hmm. parts of their lives like any time that you attempt to whitewash half of that it's not good <laughs> exactly so so there's that um there's also of course there's places in the at least i know of a few places in the world and almost of them are in the u.s because obviously i'm from here but like san francisco is a huge gay mecca um, and, and there's a ton of history there. You have the Castro. That's where Harvey Milk was murdered. Um, so it's it's a really and it played a huge role in the normalization of um, gay culture in the United States. And then within the United States, there's smaller places as well. Two of which I love. Well, one of which I love. Um, <laughs> Provincetown, Massachusetts. It's um, P-town. Um, it's basically a giant town that's a gay community. And if you want to see like what the world could be like if if everybody just got along you should go to p-town because it is such an incredible place it's at the tip of cape cod it's anybody's welcome in this town as long as you're okay with rainbow flags being every freaking where that um, is, so i'm glad that you brought that up because so i don't know if i would assume that my presence would be helpful somewhere like that you know like i don't want to put i never want to put like my learning over the like health safety and of like a community and so sometimes outsiders aren't welcome places. Like there are places in the world that you shouldn't go, right? Like, and so I'm glad that you that you illuminated that as a place that is that is not like that. That it that it, it is as long as you know you come with an open mind that that you're welcome, right? Because what I don't want to do is I think that there are there. There's hundreds of years of history, but especially the last 60 years of history is a lot of times artists and LGBT community making places cool and then middle-aged white people coming in and pricing them out or exactly. middle-aged white people coming in and changing the culture so much that it's no longer serves the purpose that the gay community needs it to serve. And I, you and I have just talked about uh, gay bars and stag parties and hen parties and how it's not really... Um, and how uh, straight women aren't behaving themselves <laughs> in gay clubs. So I just, it's, it's, um, I think you just want to be careful when you're not in a community that when you go in there that you're one, respectful, and two, that it really is appropriate for you to be there. Oh, yeah. And uh, when it comes to P Town, though, I don't, I don't think it's, a, it would never be a problem, first of all. Um, it's such a cool place, and families go there as well as crazy, rowdy gay boys who want to just party it up. And it's, it's insane. It's a, an insane place in a way because everybody just gets along. Um, um, and honestly, like when it comes to like, you know, a stag party or whatnot, um, that would not fly well in P Town. Like, that would be shut down pretty immediately. Like, people would just not deal with it. Um, so, so it's kind of almost like this mecca of places where you can just go and be yourself. You just, you know, you do need to have an open mind because um, straight people in P-Town are in the minority. 
<laughs> for sure. I, I have a cousin who um, vacations there um, with her family, but she has been in uh, the New York fashion scene for so long yeah. that she has an extended family yeah. that includes people. You know, I mean, like, it's just, a, it, it is different. I just, I never kind of thought of it as a place that, like, anyone could, I, kind of, I guess I kind of felt like it was an invitation type of place yeah. and it's nice to know that it isn't because it's, it's a, a place that I've always been interested in seeing you should definitely well maybe we'll go there one day we should do that we should go because it would be so fun oh my god we and there's so many so things that fun. I could show you there you, your <laughs> mind would like you, you might be like holy sh- holy moly like this is crazy yeah it's such a cool place and then of course there's Fire Island in New York um Fire Island is a really tiny little island, and um, it's always been a place where gay people would go. Um, so, like, even, like, right after the Stonewall riots, and even before the Stonewall riots, gay people would go to Fire Island because it was kind of far out there. It's kind of as secluded as you can get if you want to be within commuting distance from New York City. And um, that's the one place that gay men specifically, at least in there's two towns in Fire Island, but gay men specifically in one of the towns could hang out and literally just be themselves. There was no problem, whatever. You could hold your partner's hand or whatever. Um, so, and it's still that type of place, you know? Um, and then in Delaware, there's Rehoboth Beach, which is not necessarily a gay place, but it's like one of those places where the gay people took it over, so to speak. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's a few places in the world, of course. And also uh, like the Canary Islands in Gran Canaria in Spain. Back to Spain, um, the, the Canary Islands, um, uh, Gran Canaria, Masa Palomas, that area, it's like super, super, super gay friendly. In fact, like I feel like when I was there, all the businesses were trying to get LGBT um, business, you know? So it's a, it's a cool place. And th- those are the places that I know of, at least. That's excellent. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, I'm going to go to that monument in Berlin and then, uh, you'll have to come back and we'll talk about that one. Uh, maybe in some more yeah. detail and I'll, I'm going to start like, it's one of those things doing this show has made me realize that even when I try to look for like representative history, just on my own for my person, how like hard it is because it's not in, the list of things to do, you know, you go to a city, you pull up like 30 things to do and, you know, very few of them really deal with uh, like really some of the issues that have really been affecting people for most of human history, because we're still not at a point yet where we might be at a point where we're creating laws and, and accepting people, but we're, we're not really at a point yet where we're memorializing them, which is why I think this, the, this bandstand and Sonia's story is so interesting good for barcelona for doing it and um unique and it was really good for me to just stand in front of it and think about it yeah. so uh yeah. thank you so much for telling me about it um i'm pretty sure i started this question differently i don't remember where i was going so i'll just back up and say uh jose my friend where can people find you oh all right so i am on all the social medias um on facebook it's um my normal gay life on facebook on twitter it's normal gay life because somebody has my name Uh, Um, somebody has my name on twitter too and i'm so mad about it yeah um on on instagram which is the one that i really care about the most it is my normal gay life so and my blog is um my normal gay life.com excellent well thank you so much for coming on and uh like i said you'll have to come back absolutely thanks for having me I want to say thank you again to Jose for coming on the show. You should definitely check out his website, My Normal Gay Life. And also, um, I hope he inspired you like he has inspired me to think of the different types of human history that you maybe are not exploring, whether it's at home or out in the world, that there are whole pockets of people that um, whose stories are not always told in the main narratives of history and that you have to do a little work to find them but when you find them it's worthwhile because they're stories that you you need to know and knowing them changes your perspective on the world so thank you jose so much for coming on uh jose wanted me to mention that part of why we decided to do hurry up and get this interview done was because of pride month first of all happy pride 
Um, this episode is obviously coming out in uh, the middle of June, so happy Pride to everyone. Uh, he and I have been planning this episode for about six months. He told me the story, no, longer than that. He told me the story eight months ago. Four months ago, I went to the place, but we had planned to do the episode in three weeks and then I would drop it in July and then we realized no that was silly this really needed to come out during Pride so uh, thank you to Jose for not only coming on but for moving your interview up so we could get it out in June um I have so much housekeeping to do so much housekeeping I first of all I apologize that I have not done an intro and an outro in 11 episodes uh it started out that I was you know, I was traveling in places without great Wi-Fi, and then I was like, well, I'll just add them later, and then it just got away from me, and then I ended up in places with truly horrific Wi-Fi, like seriously the worst Wi-Fi I've ever seen in the world, <clears throat> Greece. <clears throat> so it just got away from me, and once I wasn't doing them, it was like, well, I wanted to restart, but then it, it, it was just hard to force myself to restart, because um, I tend to record the interviews when I'm in Sofia, and then record the intro out as I'm on the road so you guys kind of get an idea of what's really going on day to day so I apologize but the intros are back the outros are back um right now I am recording this from Yerevan Armenia I have been this is week four of a one month backpacking trip through the Caucasus so I did two weeks in Azerbaijan a week in Georgia and a week in Armenia it's been fun uh, since the last time I talked to you guys, I actually launched two new projects. So I launched a new podcast, which is called Rick Steves Over Brunch. Me and Chris Mitchell, uh, whose website is Traveling Mitch. He and I, um, he, was the, he was the guest for the episode about the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul. He and I have a new show where we watch episodes of Rick Steves' television show, which you can find on YouTube, uh, Rick Steves Europe. So each week, well, every other week we watch an episode and then we discuss it break it down Uh, we have lots of different categories it's really fun we also talk a lot about travel tips on the way sometimes we're reviewing episodes that are you know 18 years old 14 years old where things are very different so it's fun to see what uh the old haircuts and stuff in the shows and then that's a good time so that's called rick steve's over brunch and if you are listening to this show because you love travel definitely come check it out. You don't have to watch the Rick Steves episodes to listen to the show and enjoy it. It is fun if you do, but um, you definitely don't have to. And that's available iTunes, Android. It will be available on Spotify soon. And then the other project I launched is a, a new blog all about the Balkans and Bulgaria. So since I'm headquartered in Bulgaria and I do a lot of travel in the Balkans, I've been to every country in the Balkans, uh, me and Allison Green, who was uh, the guest on the episode about Albania, we have a new website that's all about traveling in Sofia, and that's called sofiaadventures.com. Right now, there's a lot of Bulgaria, Romania, and Greece stuff up, but eventually we're going to cover the whole Balkans. So if you are looking for travel tips in that part of the world, you can email me. You can also go to Sofia Adventures, and we have tons. Of, we, we already have 20 articles up in the website. Uh, only two months old and we've been also backpacking the entire time that we've been running it so (laughs) it's been a little crazy so between launching a new podcast launching a second website plus uh, being on the road the entire time uh, the intro slipped but they're back and I do apologize Um, if you could rate and review the show in iTunes or the podcast app of your choice that would be fantastic since the last time I talked to you got some cool new five-star reviews this one I really liked subject line I love this show great Uh, I honestly love listening to this show listening to all the different guests share their knowledge about historic places and Stephanie contributing what she knows based on her experiences visiting those places make for such an incredible conversation five stars all day that is so nice so I really appreciate that Um, If you haven't left a review on the show, it would be great if you would go into the podcast app of your choice, leave a review, tell me what you like. You can tell me if you want me to change things too, but just give me some feedback. I love it. And then um, the only other thing I'll say is I was on an episode of the history of Vikings. You guys heard Noah come on and talk about uh, Russ Kilda in Denmark. I was on his show talking about what it's like to travel in Scandinavia, travel tips, how to save money in that part of the world, um, 
you know, what it was like traveling to places uh, seven or eight years ago before they were super cool, <laughs> before everyone liked biking. So um, we'll link to, so we'll link in the show notes to my new show, which you can check out. We'll link to the blog, the new blog if you want to see it. Um, we'll link to that interview with Noah. And then, um, yeah, I've missed, I've missed talking to you guys. I don't know uh, how many of you guys are still listening all this way to the end of the episode, but if you are, I appreciate it. And uh, thanks you so much for listening in general. Thanks, guys.